hey, it worked. That's all that matters. Mm -hmm. All right, we're a couple of minutes early. I mean, you can start early if you want. You can wait until the clock actually says two o'clock if you want. Or uh, it's 11 out. for you. Oh, I wait, guess, I can. Or... What if I unshare the screen and then try to reshare it later and it doesn't work then? Classic. Be that, funny. that would be, that'd be how I expect it all to work. Yes. If it ain't uh, broke, don't fix it. Yeah. <laughs> Ah, oh, business side of working. See the business side, yep. the part that no one wants to talk about but has to get done. Is it always just going to be like pay me? It, well, uh, as one person, as the question in in Zoom was like, "What happens if they don't send you invoices?" Sometimes it is just screaming, "Why won't you let me pay you?" <laughs> um, <laughs> but a lot of it is just like this is just all like terminology and stuff, and mm. yeah. <laughs> use more of that yeah because voice actors talk to each other and of all of the creative contract worker groups on the internet i feel like they're one of the best organized um we all have like hubs for information that everyone can go to everyone tells everyone everything we're all super interconnected uh so there's a lot of consistency across all of them no matter which voice actor you're working with so it's a good idea to know terms yeah all right, I will shut up and let you take over now. It's all yours. Starting a whole minute early. Okay. Uh, hi, everybody. We're going to talk about the business side of working with voice actors. Specifically, a lot of the terms and things that the community have sort of come together uh, to make so you can understand when you go out to hire voice actors, uh, what, what you're looking for, how you're working with them, things like that. Uh, I got to start with the thing. Where I talk about who I am first, though, right? Right? I made a slide. I made a slide. Awesome. Hi, I'm Ayu, and I am a voice actor sometimes, and I'm a director sometimes. Uh, I directed the dubs for all of these shows, um, and uh, all of these shows as well. And uh, I was also assistant director for all of these shows, and like a couple dozen more that I couldn't fit on this screen, but like pick your favorite. Um, and I also work on visual novels. I've cast and directed a lot of visual novels for other people. And of course, I have cast and directed all of mine. This is where I plug my games. Ta-da! So I have worked with a lot of voice actors, and I've worked with a lot of companies, and I've seen a lot of paperwork, and I've heard a lot of terms. And now I'm here, and I'm going to tell you all about them. So let's start with my favorite part, the pie chart! Woo! All right, when I found out I was doing this talk, I set out like an informal survey on all my socials asking voice actors, hey, what are red flags in an audition? What is it that you see in an audition that immediately makes you go, I would not read for this. I do not trust this creator or anything like that. And you simply wouldn't audition for the part. And I got a pretty good sample set of answers. So we'll just look at them real quick. Uh, the lower ones are things like the audition asks, could you do five versions of this line for the audition? Uh, required Discord participation, apparently is an immediate no for some people, the project doesn't look like it's finished yet, or on usage stuff. Usage is a term, and we're going to talk about it later, but for now, uh, other, that's just other, uh, the project is too ambitious, hey, this game is going to be 500 hours long, we've got three sequels planned, but you know, none of it's done yet, but we promise it will be. Uh, unclear sides are bad grammar, uh, so the audition sides look like, you know, they weren't very written very well. You see a lot of bad grammar or misspellings in the auditions. And the pay rate is really low, uh, sort of hit the top. But for the number one thing that's a turn off for everyone for looking at auditions is give us your rate when you audition for us. That actually outstrips a low pay rate for reasons people would not audition for a project, which, oh, uh oh. Um, <laughs> that's, that's a problem because I see so many people holding auditions who do that. So let's tackle that one first. How do you pay people and what do you pay people so you can put it in your auditions? Let's figure out your pay system. All right. There are sort of three basic ways that voice actors usually get paid. Uh, first there's the per hour rate, uh, per hour is per hour spent recording in a session with your director and things like that. Uh, the only space in voiceover where this is different is audiobooks, which typically pay per hour of finished audio. It's a whole thing. Don't think about it. If you're making visual novels, you're paying per hour of time spent recording. 
So if you dedicate an entire hour to perfecting one line, which you shouldn't be, but if you do, you still pay them for the full hour, even though you only got one line out of it. Uh, this is usually rounded up. So if you're recording for an hour and one minute, you pay them for two hours. You will also see people list a minimum. Usually it's two, which means that no matter how long you spend up to two hours, you're still paying them for two hours. So if it's a 30 minute session, they still get paid for two hours. And then every hour after that, uh, you know, three hours, four hours, et cetera, you just add one on uh, at a time. This is per session. So it's not you do two hours and then after that, every hour you record with them, like if you record another hour with them tomorrow, you only pay them for the one. It's every time they have to get in that booth and start recording, there's a two hour minimum set. Uh, the good thing about this though, is that one, you get to spend time really working on the lines. Like if you want another read, you can sort of keep going back, spend time massaging it, looping around. And if the script isn't finished or it's an ongoing project, you can have multiple sessions where you call them back to do things like that. And this is really ideal for fully voiced games. So you could spend time working on it. Uh, another way to pay them is per line. So, uh, so, so many dollars per finished line, which uh, is good if you have like a smaller game or a partially voiced game or something like that, where you only need a certain set of lines. And it's ideal if your script is finished for this because, you know, otherwise you have to keep going back to get more. And at some point in time, you know, just tacking on more money for every extra line you send out can get really frustrating. And the other limitation of this is that the number of retakes you get is usually limited. Uh, the voice actor will probably negotiate this with you and say, hey, I'll only give you one or two retakes before I'm going to start charging you for even more. Uh, however, this is a pretty good way to keep costs low if you have a smaller budget or you only need a few lines done. And the third way is the flat rate payment, which is very similar to per line. You agree on a fee up front uh, for what's going on. This is usually used for like trailers and commercials and stuff where you're like, hey, I'll give you this much money for you to record this trailer voice, et cetera. Um, this also has a limited number of retakes and you definitely need to have the script finished at this point in time, you can't like go back and do fixes because you've already agreed upon the rate and any changes or updates will cost you extra. So this is one of those things that you're going to want to use mostly for trailers or commercials or videos or things like that. Uh, so these are the types of payment. The first two are the most common. If you have a fully voiced game, you're probably going to want the first one. And of course, I hear everyone asking, but what are the numbers? And the numbers are constantly changing. So instead of telling you numbers, I'm giving you URLs where you can go and find the most recent numbers. The first one is the link to the voice acting club, which any voice actor is going to send you if you say, hey, what are your rates? They're just going to send you this link anyway. So get ahead of it. Uh, the voice acting club is run by a lot of professional people like in the industry who are still actively working and have lists of uh, they have the indie rates guide which is really handy for us which talks about like you know if you have really low budget this is commonly how much you offer versus you know bigger budget projects and things like that and so it's a really good idea to see where the industry standard is at so that you can tell people about it oftentimes especially newer actors are willing to work at a lower budget you just have to be upfront about how much you can afford to pay uh, the second link is for sag aftra the union excuse me, the union and their rates. And while you probably won't be going union, although we'll talk about that later too, uh, it's a good idea to check their rates too, just sort of to see where the industry is at and also get an idea of the types of recording that uh, the union's looking at. Because even if actors are non-union, they're still talking with actors who are. Again, actors all talk a lot. Voice actors talk, ha <laughs> ha, we got jokes. All right, so things to communicate when you're talking with your voice actors, not just in the auditions, but in upcoming sessions, in, in the, the content in, of your game. Uh, first off, usage. I promise we'd loop back around to usage. Usage is basically what's your project, what platforms are going to be used in, what's the nature of it. So for example, if you're making a visual novel and you want to release it on PC, you tell them this is for PC. If at some point in time you port it to mobile or you port it to console, those are different usages and will require different negotiations. And you have to be upfront about how it's getting used. You also have to talk about like how it's getting used in terms of like which game is it getting used in? Like, is it getting used in game A? Well, in game B, 
if there's a flashback, can you just reuse their lines from the previous game? You can if you talk to them about it. Um, you probably shouldn't if you don't. So which games is it being used in? What's the context? Oftentimes when I negotiate with voice actors, I explain it'll go in these games, it'll be released on these platforms, uh, but also I would be using snippets or clips for trailers, for commercials, for things like that, for the game in this context. Um, I would never, um, if I were a big conglomerate and I was selling toys and you could push a button and would say a line, that would be something different. And you'd have to talk about that usage as well. Content. Uh, the nature of the content is not nearly as important as the context of the content. And it is important to be upfront about that. I promise you will find people who are willing to tell your story, but you do have to be upfront about what it is. So it's not just, is there nudity, but what's the context? How is it presented? What's the story? Is there violence? What type, what kind? Uh, how does it work? Is it, does the player merely witness it or are they the ones enacting it? Uh, things like that so that voice actors can understand what they're getting into. Oftentimes it helps knowing before the session, going into it, what is going to happen. And vocally taxing sessions, which you're going to hear a lot about, especially in terms of like video games. Vocally taxing sessions are, of course, characters who have to scream a lot, who have to shout. You've got your Dragon Ball Zs, you've got your fighting games, but also voices that are very difficult to maintain that might be really hard on the throat. Sometimes you will find that people charge a higher rate for vocally taxing sessions or require you to have shorter time periods, like I can only record for an hour at a time for this before it's no good. And all of this is stuff that you have to talk about ahead of time and ideally goes in your auditions so that people know what they're getting into. No one wants to audition for what they think is a quiet character uh, and then suddenly have to be screaming for three hours straight. All right, and as a side note, uh, since I mentioned your audition sides, uh, the audition sides is just a document with uh, all the lines that you want your voice actor to read to audition. And uh, according to tradition, they're called sides because they only contain one character's side of the script. Ta-da! Now you know what sides are. Call them sides and you look so professional. If you have a full script in there with another character in there, they're no longer sides, but that's okay. People call them that anyway. All right. Real quick, we're going to talk about the difference between director, casting director, and studio. We already had to talk about what directing is. If you're watching this video in the future, devoid of any context, real quick, the director is the person who actually sits in the session live with the actor and helps them through the reads, gives them the context of the story, makes sure that they sound like they fit with all the other actors in the scene. Sometimes the director is also the casting director. Casting director is the person who runs and organizes the auditions. They find actors. Oftentimes, they're very well connected and can find actors you can't, especially if you have incredibly specific needs like a certain accent or something like that. The casting director is the person that you would hire to do that. They will oftentimes select the actors, or if you're the client, they can send you a list of like, these are my five favorites, pick your favorite from them, or something along those lines. And a studio is a place that will provide you with a director and a casting director and usually an engineer and a space to record or at least a setup to record. And they'll even send you the final audio files afterwards. So you could do any or all of these jobs yourself or you could hire someone else to do it. But now you know the terms if you're looking for someone to help you with that. All right, how to read an actor's profile. There are actors everywhere. They have social media. They put these things in their profile. Agents and representation. A lot of actors have agents. If they have an agent, if they have contact info for an agent in their profile, you hit up the agent. You send them the sides. You tell them you're interested. You put all the information like pay, say you'd love to hear from them, and the agent will get back to you. Or they won't. It's tough. But that is who you have to contact. If you try to contact an actor directly, chances are they will simply forward your email to the agent anyway. Um, you're also going to see a lot of terms like remote capable or details about someone's home setup, especially now as recording remotely has gotten a lot more common and a lot easier. Uh, you'll see things like DAW, home studio specs, etc. And those are just details on their audio recording setup from home. So we're going to talk about those audio setups a little bit and see what's up. In other words, how do you get the audio or when you're done? Now, if you hire a studio, the studio will record it for you. They'll either provide a space for an actor to come in and record, or they'll handle all the streaming and over the internet stuff. 
It's probably the easiest, most convenient way to do it because they'll often have an engineer who does the editing for you on the audio as well. It is, of course, also going to be the most expensive. Uh, there's also a version where you record, especially if you have an audio engineer who knows how to do a Pro Tools session. This could be an option for you. Uh, actors who are remote capable often have software like Source Connect or who can use Source Connect now, which means they record on their side, it goes through the internet and by magic shows up in your session. It is your job to record, cut, edit, everything like that. But, you know, the power's in your hands. So if you see remote capable, that means they can do that for you. You also have where the voice actor records on their side which means that you want to know about their digital audio workspace. That's sort of whatever they're going to be recording in. And, you know, because things keep changing and there's always new stuff on the market, just sort of do your own web searches to see what's good. But genuinely, as long as they have one and they know what it is, you're probably fine. So they record on their end instead and then upload the audio files to you afterwards. Sometimes this is referred to as making a backup recording. Uh, oftentimes, that the backup recording implies that you're recording as well, but that terminology of the VA has to record on their side, usually backup recording is the term that you would use. Once they upload it, you would do all the editing and audio cutting yourself. If you ask the VA to do it, you would have to pay them for that too. Some people are happy to do so. Again, be upfront, negotiate with them, talk about it. Uh, there's also an interesting option where the site can record for you. And I have seen this used mostly for podcasts. It's actually not super common in VA circles at the moment, but uh, sites like Riverside will allow you to stream back and forth, but it does a local recording on each person's computer and then automatically uploads it after the session is over. So there's a fee involved, but if you're willing to do that, then you don't super have to worry about making sure the other person on the other end has remembered to hit the record button because you're hitting the record button, but then you also don't have to do like live engineering either. You get all the raw files afterwards. It is, again, it's, it's really popular for podcasts. I have not tried it in any other context, but I have seen a couple groups who have. It is there. It'll be new. You might have to describe it to the voice actor. It might be new to them, but that's also an option. All right. You're also going to see in a lot of profiles, the term sag e. Oh, we made it to the union section. Yay. Uh, so SAG-E means they are eligible to join Screen Actors Guild, the union, but they are not union yet, which means they can still do non-union projects. Let's talk about non-union versus union projects. All right, sag after. what's up with that? So we got union projects and we got non-union projects. Made a Venn diagram. I'm very proud of myself. Look at these circles. So who can be in a union project? Union actors. Genius. I know, right? Who can be in non-union projects? I know you're on the edge of your seats. Non-union actors. All right. So if you're in the union, you can do projects that the union has certified. And if you're not in the union, you do all the others. Is your project union or non-union? If you don't know, the answer is you're non-union. But what's this space in the middle? SAG eligible. All right. So in order to actually get into the union at some point in time, an actor has to be in a union project. And usually that union project will write them in. There's some extra paperwork that says, hey, this person isn't union, but I like him enough to put them in my show. And once that happens, that actor becomes SAG E, which means they haven't joined the union yet, but they are now eligible for future union projects. Um, if they do enough of them, they are required to join the union at some point, but right now they're in sort of this liminal middle space where they can still continue to do non-union projects. So if you see SAG-E, don't be scared, you can still use it. Of course, what if you wanted to do a union project because you've heard about this really cool deal where like they have this indie video games thing where it's not nearly as expensive and you can get access to union actors and things like that. So let's talk about that. What is going on with that? Well, as of today, which is January 28, 2023, whew, uh, SAG defines a low budget project as anything that costs less than one and a half million dollars to make. So congratulations. I think, I think you count. Uh, I know I do. 
Anyway, uh, so if you are under that threshold, you are allowed to work with union actors for a lower hourly rate. And as you can see, there are a lot of numbers here about the type of work that's being done, whether it's on camera or off, whether it's a vocally stressful session, things like that. Uh, there are also more things that you have to pay into the union on top of paying the actors that help for union things like, you know, they have a lot of lawyers who fight for union rights, they have a healthcare program, et cetera. Um, that is part of what you're paying into the union when you do a union project. And if you are fortunate enough to sell many, many games or many, many subscriptions, there's also extra money that you have to put in at certain levels. These numbers are bound to change. Things are constantly shifting. Deals are constantly being renegotiated. So the best thing to do would be simply to email them and ask what's up, ask for the paperwork, ask how to apply. There, too much is changing too quickly for me to put much of that in here, but those are the basic ideas. And so earlier when I mentioned looking at union stuff, part of it is that even if you can't pay these rates, you will still see things like how, how much a vocally stressful session costs in comparison to one that isn't. And oftentimes those ratios you'll find will be very similar in non-union work anyway. Okay, uh, also in the in March, that was my talk. That was, I, you know, gotta leave some room for questions, but also just a reminder that Nano is in March and I like to handle the itch.io part of it. It's a big community event, but I want everyone to go because it's fun. Yay. Um, I did, I did put this in here before I saw the bingo card. So it counts. All right. Question time. Are there questions? These are places you could find me. I'm on most of the socials. All right. So amazingly, you weren't, you didn't know, but the chat like shut up for like the majority of your talk because they apparently were all paying attention. I <laughs> went really record. fast on that too. Sorry. <laughs> they stopped typing. Can you believe it? What? Yeah. But <laughs> you had their attention the whole time. So now they're kind of booting up. The, the, I will say the chat exploded when you start saying them what the bar for low budget was. So they all started yeah. talking. <laughs> the first time I saw that, I was like, hmm, okay, okay. Yep. Like, I qualify. Sure. sure. All right. Here's an actual I'm question here. Can you talk more about how you know if a game is suited for partial voices or not? Uh, so typically, I have found that partial voices are better for games that maybe have repetitive things. For example, if you're doing uh, a, a sim game where characters show up and every day if you do well at a certain task they're like good job and you sort of cycle through like maybe 30 different phrases of good job or iterations if you don't have a big budget you can just have the voice actor do five iterations instead of all 30 and then play it over that text which is like super common in a lot of looping games like that or you can oftentimes if you want people to have an idea of a voice, but you want the reader to still come up with their own stuff, you can just have noises like, ha ha, or just to get like the mood and the voice type in the reader's mind and then let their imagination take over and do the rest. Typically, I like my games fully voiced for a lot of reasons. I like the accessibility of it. Um, I also just love working with voice actors. So there's that. Uh, but also I feel like it's a more immersive experience in terms of making it either audiobook like or a little bit little bit more cinematic. But if that's not the vibe you're looking for, then you probably don't have to go with that. Cool. All right. So Nye is asking, do you have any experience with live mass editing events? And if so, do you have any advice for anyone running them? Because Dev Talk apparently did this last year and they're planning on doing it again um live mass auditioning uh do you mean like being in a space and people come in one at a time on whatever like video conference thing you're doing uh I've never done it remotely I have run many many auditions in person um and that's just usually it's you, the sound booth becomes a revolving door instead it's 10 minutes in read the lines take one direction read the lines again and out and as with most things you usually have a pretty good idea of what you want for the characters and so oftentimes what you're looking for isn't necessarily the character when you're with someone but how well they take direction how well the two of you click or how well they click with the director if you've hired one in that case uh you don't need a lot really three lines tops just to get an idea of feel 
And I think, yeah, don't, don't, don't worry about spending too much time on it. Uh, auditioning is the job for voice actors and they're used to just, you know, in, out, you, you've done it. Cool. All right. Someone's asking, are there standard protocols for when you hire someone and it's not working out? Uh, you can recast. It happens constantly for all sorts of reasons. Uh, I mean, just be gentle about it and let them know up front. I think the worst thing to do is not tell them. I've known way too many people, self-included, where, you know, you thought you were in a project and it came out and you really weren't. Uh, people understand. Just say, hey, I or the client. Uh, yeah. What what's the phrase going in a different direction? To say, hey, it's not exactly the vibe I was looking for. I'm really sorry. Here's your payment for the hours we've already spent together. And I do hope I get to work with you again on something else. It happens. It happens a lot. Uh, and just be as honest as you can, as early as you can about it. Um, in fact, okay. two yeah. years ago, I got recast in two separate video games at the same time for the same reason. And one video game never told me so when the trailer came out I almost shared it and discovered I was not in it uh the other one the director texted me personally and said hey just so you know the play testers don't think your voice fits so we're picking someone else and I was like awesome thank you love you it was a lot nicer to just hear it cool all right one quick one where it's like if you have a game that has hard to find voice actors like a game center on old men or something how can you widen the search how can you answer? That is where a casting director comes in hand. You definitely want a casting director. We all talk to each other. Everyone knows everyone. And if you're going to looking for hard to find voices, you're just going to want someone who can not only find those difficult voices, but also who knows which actors are going to be the best for you as well. Who's like really in the industry and working and things like that. Um, oftentimes, they will also put out an open call just sort of to cast a net to see if they can find other people who they didn't already know. But ideally, you're going to want a, a casting director. It's literally their job to find those difficult to find voices for you. Cool. All right. Last question. Uh, if you're crowdfunding or something, is it better to assume the total cost beforehand or to cast and then calculate the total cost before launching the thing, the Kickstarter? Oh, no, 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 please always have your budget before you start crowdfunding. That's just like a general yep. thing. That's not even voice acting. Uh, when you're casting, your script should be close to done anyway. I mean, there's no accounting for things like DLC or sequels. But by the time you're casting, you really want to already have a pretty good idea of how much money you're going to be spending on the whole thing. And for voice acting in particular, once the script's done, you can, you've got the number of words that a person has to say. So that's a pretty good way to figure it out already. And I would strongly recommend making sure you know how much money you need ahead of time. Also, it would be weird to promise that you could pay someone a certain rate and then find out you can't. Yep. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. It has been, it has been great as always. And uh, Shino, you're, you're next. Okay, okay. I'll share my screen yeah. and... Yep. Let's see. Yep. The computers and the internet's doing the things. 